Hi, this is Natu, a guy who's way too old and way too long involved in this game, and you're watching Thorin's YouTube channel. Right, this is going to be another episode of Talk to Thorin, and I'm joined by Natu, who is the co-founder and marketing director of Ents. Obviously, you just know him as Mr. Ents, because no one knows anyone else from Ents, just the way it is, sorry, that's how the esports industry works. So, obviously, we have done many pieces of content over the years, but last year we did a piece, which is kind of what I'm doing a follow-up to here, where... One thing I've realized is in the industry, I've, I, I made a joke about this to fans, this is why I'm making this point now, which is I, I do get a bit triggered when fans tell me stuff like, yeah, but what do, how would you know that? And it's like, because you know, when I have people on my shows and they tell me that stuff, I can just message them without doing the show. I just don't have to turn the webcam on. They can actually just tell me some interesting info that I might use. But I do forget sometimes myself to do it on camera. Like essentially, I actually realized I do know loads of org owners. So rather than us all just speculate on talk shows, why don't we also just actually find out what they think and what's going on behind the scenes? So obviously in your case, Natu, I would say at the outset, one thing I would like to ask you about is, I would say in general, compared to most dogs, it seems like you have actually tried to have sort of a transparency approach, right? And give people sort of insights through tweets and videos and stuff as to what's going on in Ents and what the guys are thinking. And I notice you are one of those people who will try and address like community speculation about things like, do we need to sell players or what the, what's going on with the orgs? Like, what would you say on that front? Have you tried to, are you, are you intentionally trying to be like a bit more transparent with fans? What's the notion behind it? Uh, yeah, hundred percent. I think something we learned through the years. Um, if we go back to the infamous episode where Alexi B was benched back in the day, sure. and everything, you know, surrounding that, and uh, in a situation where, as an organization, obviously we were much smaller, uh, we were in less control of that situation, um, and yeah, it was a lot of fun. So, like ever since, of course, a, a big learning process that we've gone through over the years. And one of the fundamental things we've thought about is like, what's the point of not being transparent, right? Like. The easiest path to go by is typically to just say the truth and say what's going on, right? And try to try to make sure that everyone's on page uh, of what's happening. And it kind of goes through like also how we operate on like the business level to our staff as well. So like we have a very much transparency policy also in terms of like everyone in the company uh, gets an update once a month where where the organization is. Oh, okay. whether it be financially, you know, what potential commercial <coughs> partners we have, what discussions we have with uh different teams or games or whatnot so it's a, kind of a through and through policy we have that we try to be as transparent as we can right obviously in this episode i will ask you some specific situations of players leaving or what's going on but actually as a broader topic i noticed you addressed something yourself publicly which is to be fair i will say disclaimer i'm sort of one of the people saying the thing you're sort of responding to his it's a bit weird but I, let's get your take so when i will say on a talk show something like the problem if you're ents famously i said this when you had sphinx the problem if you're ents is to me i look at like sports essentially and i see it as like look even if you do awesome you're like a smaller premier league team or nfl nhl team and like essentially to keep a hold of a star like that's really difficult usually what happens is once their contract's up or the, the other team just wants to buy them enough the big dog comes in some massive of NHL team on Manchester City in the Premier League but they come in with loads of money and the premise the premise in those sports usually goes if especially in football if the other team just offers too much money eventually like, you almost have to say yes it just becomes the point where if, even if this player is awesome maybe just you're just priced into it it's like worth it right well in this light in the line of that the problem is instead of just saying like people will buy the best Ents players. It gives the perception that Ents is a farm team. That's what people say, right? I know that that's the, is it, is it specifically the farm team thing triggers you? Do you actually disagree with the initial premise by the way? Because I know it potentially leads into the idea, which we'll get into when we talk about the specifics, which is, this is a concept I feel like people don't understand, Yuna, is even if right now Ents doesn't pay a player X amount, let's say they pay half of X and X is the top salary, maybe the part that a fan misunderstands is, that's based on the current contract. But if someone came and offered X for that player from the big club, it's not that it's impossible that Ents can essentially match potentially or get like another spot. Is that part of what's going, what's going on with this? What was the thing that bothered you about that? Because I would just say, I think most fans thought like, well, that's insensible. Like, it seems like the, big, the, the players will get signed to the bigger club and you have to, look, it's not like your actually end point but you're like a higher level of that to some people that's what they see the vision as do you, you disagree i mean i disagree with the fact that we're not a farm team we're not a feeder team uh we're not here to just grow players and then ship them off to the falcons or other you know teams that have substantially more cash than we do on hand to, to make make a super team so whatnot but it's just the nature of the beast and the law in 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 the world that there's always going to be a bigger fish somewhere uh, someone who's willing to take a bigger bigger gamble than you 
what we're trying to be is, is we try to make reasonable choices every time. Of course, we're willing to invest when it makes a lot of sense. And we would have like, for example, we could have we could have fought for certain contracts over the last you know six months um, and had the money to pay them these ridiculous salaries if we wanted to. But that's not long term thinking, and that's not the w- way we operate. You know, we go by trying to be sustainable. We try trying to be here in ten years time. We're not the kind of organization who that thinks that you know um, put all all the all the uh, eggs in one basket today and not think about what's going to be happening in twelve months time. Um, because it's not the way it goes for us, uh, and that's that's the reality we, we live in. Um, well, at the same time, but yeah, we do understand and realize the fact that there's always going to be the bigger, bigger um, the, the certain outliers. Let's let's put it that way. That have the need or have the the way to to pay just way too much money that we can't. Like it doesn't make sense for us to to match that kind of money, right? By the way, the other thing I would say is this, is I think an area also maybe like the casual fans misunderstanding, because like I say, they actually maybe are not aware that Ents could potentially match if it was the right player and if it was the right team and you want to keep a squad together, for example. But the other angle that they're obviously not uh, uh, considering is it's also then on the player. Does the player want to stay? And that's obviously one of the bigger issues, right? Sometimes it's not even the money. It's the idea that like, if the player hears I can go to Vitality or G2 or maybe even Falcons, like some of them either competitively, they want to win everything or they just think like you say, it's not even about their salary. It's about then I'll get super team teammates, right? That's part of the issue is also like you have to win players over and away, right? Yeah, and the, the one one factor also is that um, the the buyouts are a bit crazy uh, in certain situations. So, like for example, we've been all, like we've been not conditioned, but like sort of we've been alluded to the fact that we need to buy X, Y, or Z players to keep our keep the players happy, and then we under, we we try to understand what the what it, that means econo- uh, economically. Uh, and then we're told like, yeah, this player is like 500k to get, and it's not like his his net worth at, at that point in time is nowhere near that kind of money. So we're not making silly moves like that. Um, and uh, there's there's a bit of a perception issue also between like sometimes the players um, and, and the organization, which we try to like kind of also um, make sure that the gap is not there as much as possible. We try to be as open as possible also with our players. So what what is possible, what is realistic, and what is not. Right, the complicated thing I've realized about talking about the specific transfers is they're sort of all connected if people don't know. Like part of the thing of whether people were staying or going, as far as I know, was based on things like whether the other people were staying or going or who the coach was or whether they, whether they have the spot for the RMR. So it's not as simple as this one play. We're gonna, in, they're all going to lead into each other, guys. So let's get into like the more recent stuff and then we'll go backwards after that. So obviously the most recent thing was essentially the core of the team left. That's why the RMR spot went, obviously, right? The story goes like this, if you remember. We have to start with the snappy part because that's where people remember the story began. So initially, obviously, the story was snappy is might be one of the players in the Falcons super team, which at the time, the story went had Nico 99% and was going to join and all that jazz. And then people know some of the other names. They had Magus, and obviously, they were trying to get certain other names at the time, right? When that move first happened, the first thing I would ask you is this, because I've heard later that it was about other things like who else is in this team or what's going on. Was it initially to you presented as like maybe Snappy just leaves to Falcons? Was it always a thing of like maybe the players will go with him or it, he could stay? What would you say to that? What would initially on the Snappy situation happened when he what, what did he just come to you and say I've got an offer from Falcons it's, and I'm going to go? What was the situation? Um, yeah, like uh, it was after I believe after the CAC, so like late October, early November, um, when he made that decision that he was going to leave. Uh, uh, he was not like. The condition for him was not to take any of the players with him from us, um, and and he was under the impression that he was joining there with with the likes of Nico. At the time, he's told that in 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 some different forums. Uh, so I feel okay to say that out loud. You know, that yeah, was yeah. the thought process, and, that, and of course, wanting to work with Zonic and, and Lars Robel was a big thing. And then, of course, like having having that kind of an um, yeah, having the backing of an organization that can basically go out and you know buy any player, considering he's path that he's gone through in Counter-Strike, first being in the feeder teams in Denmark and then being in a team like Ens where there's always going to be that bigger team that might, you know, it's just going to come up with some ridiculous amount of money. And ever since, he's also told me that um, he was under the impression that there were players that were going to take 
uh, potential offers, which was also affecting his thinking process. Oh, he thought some of his teammates might leave, right? I see. Yeah, so he didn't want to be a part of a, yet another rebuild and trying to you know right. figure out another player, right? That's the way that he was thinking. But then I also told him like, hey, it's not that black and white. You know, things may have not turned out that way if you had chosen differently. Um, but that whole process and how Snappy handled it was 100% very professional. I have nothing but respect for him. The way that he handled it was uh, admirable, to be fair with you. Like, we were, I was uh, the first, uh, me and our CEO were the, and, and our GM were the three people that he called straight after he told his teammates. So, like, 15 minutes after, right? So, he was uh, very much uh, doing everything by the book. I heard something mad. You can tell me if it's true. I heard something mad. Like he even actually tried to participate and stuff. Like I think he, he was even one of the people suggesting people like Glaive or maybe other people who could like be his replacement. And essentially what I'm trying to imply is he wasn't just doing it like take this guy. He was actually trying to for real be like this, like the, maybe this guy will help like build the team back up. Like he was kind of like trying to do the, the org a favor. Is it true? Yeah, it's true. Like he, I mean, he has a lot of respect for us, but we have a lot of respect for him and everything he did with us and um, everything he did for us. And, the other way around, you know, I think mutual respect was was gained through that time, and for sure he was involved. Like he had the, he had discussions with with Glaive um, to let him understand also what we are like as an org. You know, he was potentially making a, a, a first big step in his career since how many years? Like six, seven years yes. he spent in astrology, right? Prior, um, so yeah, for sure he inf he influenced Lucas's uh, thinking of of what we're like. I'll also say, just because it's an interesting point in this point in the interview, that's not necessarily a question. I will just say from talking to Snappy during this time period, he's one of the players I know a little bit. I also say, I hope fans, even if they want to be critical of Falcons or other players in Falcons, I hope they will give Snappy much more leeway. Because I will say, he basically told me his options were he was either going to stay in ends for real and hope everyone re-signed and just try for the, this year, or he said, it basically, it was only Falcons he was considering. If people don't know, he had offers from other really big teams, by the way. It's really big teams. I, I mean, some of you might even say now, if you see Falcons, Maybe he was stupid or you think he should have gone to these other teams. But I'll tell you, the thing I admire is he actually told me, basically, the reason Falcons was considered is, like you said, he wasn't thinking about just this year. He was thinking about, think of all the years I've sort of grinded and I've been at this level and I've never said she had, like, the equivalent of the number one team with all the players. And so, it because he thought he was getting eco, he wanted to have, like, one last run, basically, and see if he could sort of have a last hurrah. And so, yeah, so I actually will just say, I'm sure you have said similarly, on that level, I can't begrudge him that. Like, you know, if you, it, it's, that's cool for him specifically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I want like we have. I have no issues with Marco, and uh, we even spoke about it. You know, whoever who who knows what's going to happen in the future, it might be a, a place in ends, whether it be as a player sure, or, yeah. or in another role in the future. You know, sure. the door is always open for him to come come and and to talk with us. So yes, he left us in 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 very good terms. Along those lines, then I want to ask you a question. And the good thing now is this, Nato. Saw's so gone to heroic and Snappy's in Falcon, so it's safe. No one's in ends. We can just get what you think on this. There's no one to protect. There's no one who has to be kind of to. Here's the question, right? It's a complicated question. I notice no one knows the answer. It's only you guys inside ends. So one of the problems in ends is a lot of the of the credit events isn't just the results. It's like the the pipeline of players. Think about the names that have come. Spinks and Nerds and like some pious. Except for the odd one, some of these are like really excellent people. The endpoint ones are insane. Obviously, no one was there aren't, there aren't that many of the teams trying to get these guys not like Vitality was trying to sign these guys even though the joke is later they might try and sign them but the question always comes down to who we, who was scouting these guys who was finding them how does that process work like a lot of people want look I will say the thing that fans do that's a bit reductive is they try to figure out it's one person and they did everything the other one did nothing it's never usually that way but essentially how would you explain it so people want to know was it Snappy who scouted these players was it Saw who did it what was it like in the, at this time period when you were going through these talents um, I think one thing that we need to do is, is take a step back also and, and consider the fact that there's always people that have hired these people like Saul and Snappy, right? Like we took Saul sure. in 2020 when he was not even a proper coach, right? He was Oh, it just came from being an IGL. Yeah, sure. He was a hobble as an IGL. He had had a bit of a dabble as a coach at the time. Uh, we hired him and, and believed that he was the type of personality that we needed, a level-headed guy, um, really big brain for Counter-Strike. Um, and... Um, and then we went on to hire Snappy, right? And he, uh, that was suggested by a bunch of the players, by Saw. And then, of course, our staff was involved in all of the hiring and all the interviews and this and that and the other. Of course, I, I give a lot of credit to Snappy for sure. Um, he has a very, very good eye for, for talent. And um, he still, to this day, keeps on sending me messages about like okay. these players here That's and there cool. everywhere, right? Um, just to talk about him and whatnot. 
um, I think for sure he, he was he was very influential in, in us picking up a lot of the players. I think one of the examples was in uh, 2021 when we first started the international ends. He he was the reason we went for Spinks. Um, we were kind of in between what are we going to do with the lineup because Sp um, we had Sadix as a as a Finnish guy who's you know that doesn't even play Counter Strike at this point, right? Like we had already signed him and we were would have wanted to give him an opportunity, but but Snappy was the one that. You know, talk this through um, to make the move, spend some money on him in a time where we were not created in a financial position at that time, right after COVID year, having a horrible 2020 overall, right? Um, uh, so I would give like on a, on a surface level, Snappy a lot of credit. I That's my hunch. I mean, I wasn't day to day with them, how they operated all of that kind of stuff. But I think people forget also that it's about hiring the right people and making sure you have you built that mutual trust that, that you can, like we gave Snappy the trust through the time when they were doing the right choices. They knew what was going on and we started to be proactive and also enable them to, to do the moves. Like for example, we were quite a step ahead in a lot of situations. Like let's remember for, as an example, when we changed Dodo to Madden, for example, a lot of the community was like, okay, this is a lateral move. Like what's the right. point here? Right. But it actually, it turned out to be, a huge game changer in the way that the team was able to play because we added an aggressive component. Um, same thing when we lost Spinks, you know, um, at the time, then we also made the aggressive move of also changing two players at the at the same time, right? I mean, a lot of organizations could have easily just been like, hey, now nah, let's just, you know, find a replacement for for um, Mr. Spinks and then see where, where we can take it. But then instead, we were willing to also kind of take that risk and gamble and trust the guys that they knew what was needed for us to take the next step and be more successful in the future. So I don't think it's black and white as one person or two person doing the thing. It, the organization behind also has to help. We have to be very much in part of everything and every move and enable them to do these kind of things. And it all starts from the fact that you also need to hire the right people to the home, the quote unquote most um, brainy people you can think of who, who know what they're doing. Like, for example, I think we've done a pretty solid job now with hiring Kuban, Kuban as a coach and Glaive as an IGL, a combination that a lot of people probably thought, you know, made a lot of sense considering also like the Polish lineup we sure. have now, but yeah, it's working pretty good, right? So um, I think it's uh, at the end of the day, it's a mixture of all of those different things and all those people, it's never just one person, it's never just one thing. But if I had to just highlight one person in my head, I do give Snappy a lot of credit. And then along these lines, I also heard something along the line. I noticed one part of the whole ends like saga of the players, will they stay, will they leave, that no one seems to address or even get mad about is actually the angle of the coach saw. Everyone gets mad or they don't at Snappy leaving or going, or they get mad at the players if they were going to Rock or if they're going to Falcon. But no one even mentions Saw. So I will just say this. I want to know what you think. I heard something along the lines of that, like, that's actually also the part of this whole transfer thing that more people were missing was like some of the players and the maybe even even Snappy's thing was based on things that also like, will Saw be there or will he be going? And I've heard it was a bit potentially intimated that he wasn't as much like, well, I, I might stay, I might go. His, he was just sort of like, yeah, I want to go to Rourke, basically. Is, is this kind of true? It's kind of true. Yeah, it's just kind of, the sad, kind of sad thing, I guess, is the fact that it came out of the blue for us. Um, right. Uh, we, we heard all of us and the ones we have lost, uh, Marco, and we started, you know, going through the options. Who, would, who are we going to get as an IGL? Uh, Saw was part of that um, discussion and, and scouting out who it should be, uh, but then all of a sudden we understood that he might be potentially leaving for Heroic, that there was an offer on the table. Um, of course, we fought for him um, and um, had discussions and wanted to keep him on board considering the, the history and everything. We made him a very sizable offer as well. But even though we did that offer, counter offer from, from Heroic was so ridiculous that there was nothing that we could have potentially done. So at that point in time, you know, we just decided it's it's time to move on and um, find ourselves a new coach. We had already talked with Kuban in, in, in the past and we already made um, our, our GM was talking with him that if potentially we're going to be in need of a coach, you know, he was on standby to kind of discuss with us uh, for the future. But yeah, um, yeah, of course, like there's a lot of trust between the players we had and, and saw because of the fact that he was the coach they the only coach that ever had super successful uh, moments with, right? Like they, 
they went to all these finals and, and were one of the best teams under his wings, right? So sure. that was the only reality they understood uh, of being successful. They, for some of them, they maybe just couldn't think of another another way of being 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 a successful team. So putting in a new IGL, putting in a new coach, um, there might have been a bit of resistance in a sense of uh, of giving them room to kind of breathe and, and start to write the next chapter. And then the other thing I'd heard about the sort of heroic move, which I have to say it does align with something I want to ask you about now, which is it must have been a bit weird for you, mate, to watch those blast tournaments at the end of the year. Because knowing the things I was hearing, I imagine you were thinking the same thing. Dude, the whole community, all analysts, all web people, even the casters were talking as though like the deal was done and heroic was getting the end squad. Do you remember this? Like, dude, I would be saying like, bro, like, man, this is having none of these deals are done. It's like, also, but they were talking as though it was like a done deal it's definitely happening and, and like i say if you watch those blasts you would assume right now heroic's got the falcons line up pretty much but obviously in the end only nerds ended up going they just saw only got nerds right two things one what was it like was that weird for you that whole thing and then two it was implied again maybe saw one of the first things he did at heroic was like right get me my end score biscuit i want those guys let's get the, let's get the three people right yeah, I feel like there might have like this is just speculation at sure. this point. Um, I don't know for a fact, but I, I'm I'm pretty good at reading people. I'm pretty good at reading situations, and I have a hunch that there was definitely some play for them or some kind of incentives, maybe even made for him to try and get the get the certain the, the core of hands to to heroic. But that game didn't come through at the end of the day. Um, and um, yeah, so be it. But yeah, I mean, it was, it was kind of weird. Um, I, I could be you know everything, everything went down like that the very last minute on the 11th hour. Um, and none of the things were, were 100% sure until the very end. Um, but yeah, I mean, there was a lot of movie parts, um, which was kind of also ridiculous to a sense that we also learned along the way. Um, one thing that I, I'm not a great fan of, and you know. I don't know what these player agents are doing, but we heard also that our players, there were, there were certain agents uh, that were kind of shopping for, for our players that were still contracted for, for quite a while. <laughs> okay. Kind of ridiculous <laughs> to me to, to consider. So um, it was a lot of shit going on in the background and it was a bit dirty. And I think the most weirdest moment in, in all of esports that I've kind of been through as a as part, team part owner. Oh, yeah, I will also say, if you're a casual fan out there, the other reason why that topic is relevant is that's also, by the way, I'll tell you straight up as a journalist, that's part of how those stories get out there, guys, is those agents love to hit, those, hit you up with those DMs and tell you a message. But here's the difference. And if you're a young journalist, listen to me carefully. I get those messages all the time, but the reason you very rarely see me say it is because what I think to myself before I share the information they are giving me is why would this one person who has a, literally a biased interest, why would they be giving me a piece of info about a story that hasn't resolved like they want me to be part of the mechanism of mm. helping their side like if I the point there is this we're not saying this happened in this case but I'll use it as an example if the fans see heroics getting the sense caught and then there's like a really great public response then the joke is even the players might start thinking hey, maybe this is a good move and then people there's just these people know what they're doing these agents they understand media I'll tell you that so I agree <laughs> there's, some, there's, some, there's some shenanigans going on in that behind the scenes mate <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll, you know, a small tip to uh, all the viewers out there. You know, if you follow really closely, you can see a tendency with certain organizations and teams and players where this yes. happens more than others. Yes. Um, it's pretty easy to catch on. Yes, that's a good point. Right, all right, what about this then? Another, uh, like I told you, luckily I have a good memory, but you got, we've got to like piece this apart, piece by piece. <laughs> so another thing is, we've now got to go back a tiny bit in time to when Snappy was leaving and Glaive was going to come in, right? So I've already told that story before. Like I heard Snappy was even involved with, like he was, he was one of the people who potentially suggested Glaive. I even heard, by the way, he might have actually suggested to Glaive to join too, which is kind of, this is how you know Snappy's just too good for this world, mate. Like he's actually like helping out his old team to be really good as he leaves. Like I, the joke I told him is he should have told all the shit players like why do you want them to be good like you're gonna have to play them mate so anyway that's the side here's what i actually heard that's quite interesting so when glaive initially joined i'm sure some people thought oh glaive himself has done a cynical move what he's done is he probably didn't have loads of massive offers so he's picked because at the time he was going to get just he was just going to replace that snappy he's picked basically like a top three team in the world and he's just going to get to join i've heard that's not true now too. i've heard actually even when he joined he knew that it was possible some of these players might go right he actually did kind of just commit to a product a little bit blind right going in no and we might have to retool potentially. 
Yeah, I mean, the funny thing is, from our perspective, there were multiple moving parts at the time, right? So, um, yeah, on one hand, we were uh, hiring an IGL, we were hiring a coach, and we were also negotiating for our players that we already had, right? So, I bet that is we'll insane, see. because obviously they're all going to each ask, well, who's the players? Well, who's the coach? Like, I bet it's impossible, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly, right. So even, like, in the time span of when we were negotiating with Glaive, the situation was evolving. Um, so initially, he was kind of joining this core that we had at the time but then things evolved also simultaneously um so we also had to have a couple of discussions with him um and, and make him understand that there is a possibility that things might change there might be you know we were not expecting for this big of a change that actually did end up happening but he was very much aware of the possibility that changes might be looming certain parts might be uh changing scenery uh but no one was expecting for a total reboot of the of the lineup at the time by the way, just I, I almost mean this not even as an honor, just on a personal level, because I know you. I just want to for real know, you know what I'm asking to humans like. The first thing I thought of Natu when that lineup, the original lens with Glaive, went to that LAN, which of course was a Finnish LAN, and then they immediately got wrecked in the opening game by <laughs> Avu and Finnish Torg. I remember thinking, what the fuck is Natu thinking about this day? Because obviously at the time we're all I mean, the joke is by the end of the tournament, they were actually good and they finished top four anyway. So it was all fine. But I remember thinking, that's even in Finland, bro. That had to make you think, like, fuck, what have I done? What were you thinking when that happened? <laughs> um, I wasn't too concerned. I was mostly just laughing about it. The only concern I had, like, hey, let's hope we actually make the <laughs> sure, like, make it to the sure. arena because we had a lot of investment going to that event. Oh, you get memed on like a motherfucker too. Yeah, of course. Yeah, so um, we had our booths and everything, a lot of fan activities and everything. So, like, that was like my concern um, for it. But at the end of the day, you know, that's a big change. You're, you just change your coach, your IGL. So, Kind of a lot of the old stuff is out the window, but at the same time, they did try to kind of just continue from where they were left with Saw and Snappy. So they didn't even change too many things. They only had a you know a handful of days to even prepare for that event. So um, it was kind of ironic that that had to be the first game, and then it went the way it did. And Hobble played amazing in that game. They played, played no respect Counter Strike, and uh, kudos to them. They also flew into the top thirty of HLTV for like four months because of that win and, and the win against Gamer Legion. So they took full advantage of the position and situation. I want to ask you a question about hiring Cuban that goes like this. I actually do think Loki, even though he was the coach of the Apex team that out of nowhere finished top four at Major. And by the way, if you ever watched that game, they almost even fucking won that game. They could have been in the final, maybe even won the Major, right? Even though to me, that already should have put his stock up here. I do notice that. I actually feel like he, people had kind of forgotten about that. Like he's kind of like he was a sleeper coach by the end. No one was making this guy's name. So what, is, what I want to ask you is this. Was part of hiring things like already knowing him and having a background? Because I get, like you said, said earlier about hiring smart people i get the vibe you're not just hiring like the hot name you're hiring people you know like you can't you know who these people are you know how you know what they think you know how, what they're capable of right was was part of it the the history and being an, an old school um the the biggest part of it was the fact that we had already been in talks with kuban in 2020 um, oh right so he was a coach we were considering when twista got banned uh and we were on the hunt for a new coach and then we ended up with saw but Kuban was one of the coaches we, we had advanced discussions with at the time. Um, and we, we our GM had kept tabs with Kuban for uh, ever since every now and again, you know, keeping a relationship and understanding and knowing these people is is, is a big factor, a big um, factor into um, the hiring. So we really want to know the people that we put on the helm to to spearhead that team, right? Um, and of course, the, um, the, the fact that he has a lot of experience and he's seen all kinds of different teams, uh, younger teams. He's been a part of the VP team that must have been the most, you know, you can imagine what was it like coaching a team like VP at the time, right? Like it must have been quite a task um, considering everything. And then uh, being a coach of a team like Apex where it's much less experienced, you know, um, he had to be much more hands-on. And, and also he's, He's an adult. Uh, he has kids. He has a, a life of his own surrounding him. You can you can just tell from everything the way that he operates, also as a coach, that the life experience he has is a big asset for him as a coach. So uh, it was a combination of those things, and it was our he was our first choice once we we were looking into uh, getting a new coach. And so it happened that it, he was also on the free market at the time. So uh, it all just kind of made sense for us. 
when it comes to getting the Polish players, the nine players that came in, and now, obviously, now people think it's great. They saw the Kadavice run. They've seen the PGL stuff. So now the joke is everyone's now going to pretend like, oh, yeah, great. But I, I would have said that too. But it's not just <laughs> that you guys picked them up. I heard something crazy in one of Richard's videos. He said that once you guys were aware you had to get players, because obviously the problem is if you'd have sold one player to Rock or one player to Falcons, that would be okay. But because you sold the three to the Falcons, they got the RMR spots. You had to have a lineup all of a sudden to go in the qualifying. Richard said something mad, like you guys already had like 12 hours or something to get the players. Is this true? It is true. Yeah, it's pretty much true. Um, at the end of the day, uh, there were diff three different avenues we could have taken, right? Um, for the for the sake of, you know, I, I don't want to say out loud which ones were the other options, but there were, there were multiple, we had options. And at the end of the day, this was the one that we felt like made the most sense. And it all happened, uh, I want to say it was Sunday Midnight, the Monday was the rush to lock day, and we had to have a lineup Sunday night by um, 12 a.m. Uh, Central European time uh, because of ESL world rankings and everything. Right. So, uh, and also the RMR, RMR lock was Monday. Um, so I think the contracts were signed Sunday night, 10 p.m., 9.30 or something like this. And then we made an announcement uh, around 10, 11 p.m. or something Sunday night. Um, so yeah, it all just kind of, it all happened while we were in Abu Dhabi. Um, so, yeah, I mean, one of the reasons why Abu Dhabi was such a shit show for, for the team as well. So much going on. And and the guys, uh, Glaive and Diha and uh, um, Kuben, they had a war room going on in, in Abu Dhabi while there was separate war rooms across of Finland with me, right. our GM, our CEO. And then I had straight up communication with our communication specialist to get ready for all the announcements, all the PR stuff. So, yeah, it was a... It was a pretty, pretty much a, a shit show. So somewhere like, there was a giant whirlwind. board with a million names and and lines crossing all over, like some crazy conspiracy meme or something. Like that. Yeah, just kind <laughs> right. of going through the pluses and minuses, sure. of taking a different avenue, right? And then uh, this is how I I I, I remember once everything settled, I was like, shit, okay, we're Polish now. <laughs> <laughs> Sure. By the way, low key, that's actually even an angle. I don't. I wanted to know was that just from like memes or something? Because the joke is leaning into that angle. Not only is funny, it actually sort of works. Like like the Polish players vibe with it. Everyone's actually sort because if, if the funny thing is, it's actually quite a cool way to reinvent ends. Because ends originally obviously was just the Finnish angle. Then it was like a generalized international like underdog angle. Now you've got this weird. You are the Polish team. I mean, the joke is it's why it actually is straight banter that Glave did spell his name as Lucas, but like the Polish spelling. That's, that's pretty funny. Fair play. That's pretty good. Was yeah, it intentional to do it like that? Yeah, yeah. I mean, he's, he's he's a good guy and a lot of sense of humor. And of course, like he 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 was very much a part of also making that decision that we went this route. All right. Um, so um, uh, for him, like of course, everyone was a bit skeptical and a bit worried of the fact that there's going to be so many Polish guys and then you know a Danish guy. Then we have a Spanish performance coach. Uh, but so far, so good. And I think everyone's been really committed to the fact that. You know, it's a unit. We still are an we consider ourselves an international team, but yeah, of course, we have that Polish vibe going on. It's been I'm not gonna lie, it's gonna, it's been great in terms of uh, fan engagement. You know, having a, having a country of I mean, Poland is like what 40 million or something lot, people. Yeah. So it helps a lot in terms of business as well to have like some centralized fan base coming from a certain country for sure, especially as big as that. Um, uh, but uh, yeah, from a competitive perspective, a lot of question marks, of course, but I think. People were also at the same time. I felt like the outside uh, aspect or, or the view that people were taking it was a bit too skeptic in the sense that hey, these guys are professionals. At the end of the day, you know, it doesn't matter if they're majority Polish; they still all know how to do th stuff in, in uh, English. Um, and we have the whole structure behind them as well, regardless of the fact that they're you know four Polish players. And um, you know, it's just a matter of having the right attitude and and doing work to make it make it work. I know, I think I know what you're intimating there. So I'll ask a question. It's one something I did want to ask about, which is the one downside of this move is even though actually even when it was announced, people were kind of like, oh, interesting pivot. A lot of people, I will say, did cynically just look and go, right, well, what they've obviously done is there's a roster lock and Cubans, uh, a Cuban and Diha are Polish. So what they've done is they've just gone to Diha's mates in Nine Nine and just gone join now. And then people did take it like, this is this is just going to be a placeholder roster. It's not going to be the real roster. You know, they'll use it for the RMR. But then because most people, I think, thought you wouldn't make the major. Most people probably thought you just wait till next year wait till contracts are up and then you're going to sign a new international team like is that the sense you is that kind of what you were referring to that your people were a bit cynical about the lineup like they didn't really believe it was the real lens lineup 
Yeah, I mean, of course, I, it's it's just, I think it's reasonable for p people to think that way because everyone's so let's say short sighted, and they all, the reason the bias is so massive. You know, Nine was not having a great time over the last six months of 2023, but if you go back to the first half of 2023, you know, the team was doing great. Um, they were the kings of Vertigo, but shit on Ancient, and the majority of the map pool was not great. But you could tell that there were most definitely pieces and things that were actually really legitimately good on an international level. Add D Hot to that mix, add a GOAT IGL to that mix, and a coach with a lot of experience like Kuban. And then you have those three guys in the team. I felt like, you know, this is this is most definitely better than people expect it to be. Um, I wasn't really sure going into it. Like I had zero expectations for the first few months. I they've exceeded my expectations and majority of the general public as well. Uh, but I think people were a bit, you know, they were thinking too much about the the recent few months and not considering the big picture and what they once were uh, before their downfall happened and adding pieces like what we had in, in Glaive and Deha, uh, I think people were underestimated their effect. And I think a lot of it is the fact that people are so quick to uh, dismiss players. You know, I think Glaive is a good example. Um, people are not, ex are not expecting too much out of him. Um, but yeah, he's shown that he can still definitely hang. Well, the funny thing is, I actually think that your org is the one that has proved actually something very interesting about in-game leaders, because obviously you were the ones who got snappy in the first place. Like, I, this is what I've been trying to tell people. Like, I'll give you the example now, too. If I do my tweets where if people know, if I ride with people, I ride with them, I think they're legit. If, if Even though the joke is MSL is literally retired. He retired last year, guys. He, he doesn't want to play anymore, even. But, because it's like, they're not going to sign him anyway. I still just say, fuck it, and put him in like those imaginary lineups on Twitter. <laughs> but when I say that, right, obviously people will come to me and just go like, MSL, he was good years ago. He's like, and what they're missing is this it's like everyone would have said that about snappy four years what are we talking about like the joke is last year he was one like one of the most eligible candidates to be ideal of like the best team in the world and so similarly with glaive yes he hadn't had an awesome last few years but this is where i feel like your team your orgs proved this mate is people are forgetting the role isn't like frag people in the head it's it's be a leader and i have to say i've been i've got this line i say now where like as long as you can keep a basic skill level up and look by the way glaive's actually really good skill level obviously compared to most the IGLs even. The, in my opinion, cause experience is the ultimate factor for the IGL. That scales over time. That gets better and better over time. And I think actually what we're seeing now from people like Carrigan and Snappy and hopefully Glade's going to show it now is like, I think IGL is the one role that doesn't have to be like, you know, you washed or whatever. It's like, that. the, the big question I would have for any IGL, like I would have asked this to Glade, it's not, are you capable? It's like, are you actually motivated? Are you in on this project? Yeah, if you're going to fold it in, then yeah, maybe there's no point. But I, essentially, I would say this to you now too. I think when you look back now, it's kind of bonkers that you're like wait a minute we can just get like the best IGL ever he's just available to join like it's not like G2 and Vitality and everyone have like a bidding war for it. we can just get him now like that seems like a fucking steal right yeah it was ridiculous I felt like it was, it was ridiculous like how how is this even a discussion that we're having right now uh to an extent um and yeah uh for us also from a from a, from a financial point of view you know there was not a big buyout to pay off for him to to, to to get him to us so um and we went through a very thorough interview process with him you know we had our doubts and questions also that we wanted and needed to answer and i vividly remember being told that uh, from a psychological perspective uh, i was told that he's either a pathological liar or he's so motivated that that they've never talked with anyone as motivated <laughs> as him <laughs> I love it. So I love the I was, idea someone comes in, sir, he's either a, a complete psychopath <laughs> or uh, incredibly motivated. Like, okay. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, it was pretty easy to lean towards the second option. Yeah, obviously. Right? Sure. Sure. <laughs> um, so, I had I had zero doubts when Clay was, I was like, I was super high. I was like, this is so cool that we're going to get him. And um, knowing what his individual capabilities are when he gets his game going, seeing him play in the past. And in my opinion, he's in the prime age of an IGL. Prime age. Yes. He's already gone through, like, he obviously has an incredible resume and he's won everything uh, in his earlier 20s. Yeah, if people don't know, Glaive is only 28. Exactly. <laughs> Remember, Carrigan's like 33 or something. <laughs> yeah, and so is Snappy, right? So, like, uh, he, he's in his prime age. He already is psychologically so strong, having all that experience also in life, you know, having a kid, uh, having gone through a lot of that stuff in his real life, but also as a, as a professional gamer. Um, he obviously has won a lot and, and all that kind of stuff, but not only that, he's already matured as a professional, you know, he has a, 
certain psychological um like an edge towards the younger guys in the sense that he's gone through so many things that he has answers to a lot of these different things and then not a young rachel might not have you know he's not going to get straddled by a lot of things out there right so and also to the fact that him and and kuban clicked really well and that was kind of very vital for us as a as an organization too that we want to have an ideal uh coach combo that really see sort sort of eye to eye but not too much so they can kind of also fight each other in the sense of advancing and making their gameplay better because they don't necessarily always see everything in the same way which i think is a positive thing uh, but in the general sense they still have like the same fun- fundamental idea of how a concept of a team should be by the way one thing i also want to ask was this like it's up to you what you want to say now so i'm gonna ask a question but i'm gonna speculate in the question you tell me if this vibes or anything you've heard i also yeah. think a thing that people really mistook about glaive was they watched what happened in astralis and they saw like the results were kind of a bit whatever and going down and his game wasn't that great and they thought like oh he's just not motivated he doesn't care anymore but here's an interesting detail i think people might have missed is that actually makes complete sense to me though because he was still in astralis the angle people miss i think is this now too people might think if they're very young and naive well what does Glaive have left to do in the game you know he's already won the majors everyone says he's the GOAT like he could just retire but I can tell you people like that the reason they won the four majors in the first place is when it's the right angle they get incredibly motivated and I have heard by the way I actually fuck with this angle so much if it's true I've heard people like Glaive and Zonic look here's the cool thing about winning guys when you're together in the team winning of course you go hey we all get credit it wasn't just me but I'll tell you what these guys actually not only want to win they want to win separate to each other as well they want to like prove that like hey it wasn't just because i had device and because it was my coach it's not because they're the goats like they all have heard privately want to like prove themselves and win again without the other i mean zonic's done it himself technically i've heard this is true for glaive that he's actually super motivated to win again and to and in this case by the way he'll be winning with none of the fucking danish players you won't have any excuses in this case like no one will be essentially people will have to give him his credit what have you heard something similar um, I wouldn't know for a fact, but I would imagine that's the case for sure. Um, these, at the end of the day, all these guys are at at least in some sense egoists. Um, any you know professional that has as much success as these guys, you know, of course they want to have a one up on the other, yes. right? One hundred percent. I think um, it would be weird if they did it, but yeah. Sorry, I don't have a. I don't oh, have a, I, He hasn't told me that uh, specifically, but uh, I would. I would definitely buy that narrative. What did you think then when this crazy? I am kind of eat it run happened. Cause I'll tell you what, mate, everyone now is going to do that thing again where they're like, Oh, love ends. It's like, let me go on your Twitter and see if you did any tweets. <laughs> and they were going to go. So I Cause I don't know anyone who had this team going deep at that tournament. Mate. I mean, I, I thought it was insane. I mean, also it's not even just that it was a good run. Guys, if you go and look who they had to beat, it's like the best teams in the world. Was, this must have been that sick for you to sit and just watch it all. But were you actually there? Were you there in person? I wasn't. Uh, I okay. was. I was. Um, that weekend was a bit tough. I would have gone there if we went to the semifinals. What did you yeah. think for the run? It seemed like a fairy tale, mate. It was amazing. Yeah. Um, going into Katowice, they were boot camping at the office, and we were talking like, "Hey, this is a good tournament for us to kind of get our trial by fire and see where the game is at." You know, they'd had like what three, four weeks to prepare, um, and then all the focus was in the armor and making through the, the major. Um, so there was not really any expectations for sure to get into the playoffs of the event. Maybe get a good win, like for example, when we got the win against Charles, it felt that already at that point, like, "Hey, this is a good win. This is going to give a lot of confidence for the guys." You know, they know they can hang whatnot but then the story kept on going and going and going um it was a bit surreal for sure to watch and um it, it wasn't too far off that we could have even made the, the made the semifinals of course the added factor to the fact that it was in poland with the polish team uh all of our fan merchandise was sold out in like two hours at the event and whatnot so it was a bit crazy um from that perspective too but um yeah, a good thing is that it wasn't like they were peaking too soon also because then also they, they did make it to the major. So at the end of the day, it was still building blocks towards the bigger goals, which was the RMR making the major. And now let's consider RMR also as a building block to the, the major itself. But yeah, it was it was not expected. Let's put it that way. Right, even though now everyone is also going to just go, I never thought Astralis was good, the roles didn't work. I bet you were nervous on that last match, mate, that 2-2 yeah. game. I bet it was a bit nervy, yeah. right? It was horrible, yeah. I wasn't a fan <laughs> of the fact of how, how the uh, matchups, matchups ended up being, but sure. then also, 
I did hear from like uh, from inside like uh, the event that it, the vibes were definitely not less as Charles was alluding right. to themselves. The vibes were not good. Um, it, it it was easily noticeable apparently at the event at itself. At, at itself. So um, I was I was hopeful. I was uh, confident. I knew, knew that you know they might overthink the fact that Glaive is in their heads to an extent because I did hear like after the Katowice Astralis match that everyone in our team was saying, yeah, Glaive was the just literally in their heads, right? Uh, reading everything they were doing, understanding their rotation, understanding what they're doing, because he's Danish. You know, sure. he knows their tendencies. He knows these players really, really well. So I think they might have. Uh, it must have been the matchup of horrors for also for from an Australian perspective, having to play against Glaive. By the way, you're someone where, because you're being quite transparent, one of the things I know is a big topic to you, even before it actually blew up this year, was the whole sticker thing and how much money and the fact that it's so variable. Well, if people think, obviously we can't know yet. This is one thing I have to keep reminding people because people have done that thing where they saw a little bit of info and they remember it and then they repeat it without the context. So what people keep saying now to is, they're like, you get like 4.5 million from stickers now. It's like, well, <laughs> that, no, no, that was never it. That was one major. In fact, by the way, the reason why that was even published is because it was so much more than the previous major and it depends what capsule you're in then it depends which capsule Navi. you know what I mean there's a million factors that are obviously extra but we all get that but the point is especially for an org like yours obviously it's a big deal to get the sticker money this is enormous in terms of like whether you can fund the org whether you can buy new players like that's actually a big part as Lopez has pointed out in his articles of like how the economics of the game work now are basically it's sort of you have to gamble for the next major will I make it won't I and then you, you, you attenuate the gamble based on how much you want to spend like if you want to guarantee you make it you actually probably should the joke is spend the two million to buy the big name play because they'll probably get you the sticker if that makes sense whereas if you want to min max you're not spending as much but you're also gambling you might not make the major and make the millions so it's kind of an interesting balance I notice right the obvious question to you is this Yona in light of the fact you've just had a, a, it wasn't really an off season it's actually during the season but you've had a period where all these transfers were going on and if people look your end of the buyouts has to have been way smaller than the buyouts you got for your players because you were selling them for massive amounts. And then on top of that, you've then taken this other roster, which presumably wasn't incredibly expensive, the Polish core that's come in, and now you're qualified to a major where you're going to presumably get millions from the stickers. So Ents must be in an amazing position, actually, after these last few months, right? Haven't you kind of won out over on the plus minus? Mm, yeah, and also if, if we just think of the last few years, I think uh, we've, we've uh, been on the... Uh, we've been the all the majors, or, right? Yeah. Y- yeah, we've been, I think, seven in a row right, right now, ever since Katowice. So we've been to every single one ever since Katowice. The only capsule we missed was the RMR one during during the, oh, right. uh, during the pandemic. Right. right? Um, but other than that, we've been part of the circus um, uh, ever since 2019 Katowice. But yeah, I mean, it, there, I don't think there's any point in lying that for sure, from a financial standpoint, the major is a, is a mass, has a massive impact, even though it's impossible for us to budget it because like um, the delta is such, so massive. So it could be millions of euros. It could be just a few hundred thousand. You never know. It uh, depends on the major. Um, of, of course, every time you make it, you hope it's going to be big. But at the end of the day, we don't, we don't know that for a fact. But I think for the majority of the organizations out there, it is a massive uh, factor for for them financially every single year to make the major in Counter Strike economics. If you look at just the numbers from Australia, for example, they just uh, published their numbers yes. from 2023. Um, they missed the the Paris major, and you know it was a bit red on the side of the Counter Strike operations for them. Imagine what it's going to be like now. They just spent sure. reportedly a couple of million on two players. They missed the major, so it's it's not going to be great times for them either. So it's not only for an organization like ENS that it's going to be a huge factor. I think it's for the majority of the teams. From a financial standpoint, what can they invest into the game? It's going to be a bit of a make or break uh, with the, with how how it goes with the majors. Right? Is it the case that when you come to think of the future now? Is there a world where, here's what I would ask. I asked earlier and you did say that like, look, if Ence wants to, they can match a salary or they can, like if people don't know, the, re- the angle I also think a casual fan maybe doesn't know is sometimes you can even use this as an actual way to just get additional investment or sponsorship. Obviously you go back to your people and say to them, hey, we need to retain these players. They've got an offer from this other big team. If we get to, it might not even be the same match. It might be if we get 75% or three of them say yes, we'll get, and you can obviously get them to raise the extra money or agree to release the funds or whatever, right? Here's the question is if you been to all these majors and if the sticker money is anywhere comparable to millions for each one is there a world where just from essentially doing good business can Ents ever be in the position where Ents is the one signing the not keeping players signing the million dollar players like could there be a world where Ents is signing you know the monocies and the simples of the world is that plausible do you think if, if the current trend continues uh 
I maybe, but in the long term, I mean, it, it, right now, how I've, there's so many uncertainties right now. Like, I think the biggest uncertainty is the fact with the semi franchise league thing that is disappearing, and, sure. and that's depending on the team. That's half a million to more than a million a year that you're losing, in. Uh, and that's a big cut in terms of budget, right? So there's a lot of moving parts, and it's not only the majors. I think the there's so many like the. the Hard part of our Counter Strike economics is the fact that there's moving parts that you there that are unpredictable, um, and oh, there's writing potentially millions of years writing on a single best of three, um, but now you don't even have the predictability of through through any any leaks or partnerships and things of that nature. So I think how and direction that CS is going right now, it doesn't feel very plausible of of what you're suggesting there because of the unknown factors but uh in a in a different universe i guess where there was a bit more predictability who knows in the future once right. you know we start building a bit more bank which we've done probably we're in a pretty solid financial situation as we speak right now but it's not um it's not a coincidence that ends for the first time since a year is expanding the different games because we also want the diverse to risk a bit more now um, we have focused, hyper focused on Counter Strike for a lot of a long time, but we just signed a Rainbow Six Team for exact for an example, and we have uh, some stuff coming up and cooking for the future as well. And that's just one of the big factors is the the fact that Counter Strike ecosystem is in a pretty big unknown situation as we are right now. Another thing I wanted to ask you is, I've heard another factor, even though a lot of fans won't think about this, they'll just think about stuff like what teammates do you play with, what's your salary? I've heard actually it's a way bigger issue to pro players also, and I know it's affected your org. Things like, do you have the partner slots? Especially that blast one was the key one, because obviously every player break, afterwards we have the blast, and the problem is if you are one of the players who isn't in those slots, you're just watching at home like we all are on stream and party is thinking like, hey, I want to be in there. Like maybe, I, in fact, obviously when Ence was a top team, you could have won those events. And so I've heard for example i know that was something like i mean the joke is everyone knows this because he tweeted a million times but snappy obviously wasn't happy having to go through a qualifier to a qualifier to, he obviously just wanted to be in the groups didn't he and then uh, and then supposedly even though falcons it turns out did end up buying the blast spot supposedly that really is one of the reasons nico didn't join supposedly at the end he realized like fuck what if we're not in essentially what if we're not in blast and we don't get the louvre like what tournaments will we be in? maybe i won't be competing maybe i'll be stuck in online qualifiers right is that tricky to because obviously on that angle unless you buy the spot there's nothing to say that to the player Right, you have to just kind of OP stairs. What would you say to that issue? Was it an issue in the past? Do you think with some people that they wanted to be in these leagues? Um, yeah. Well, well, one one of the thing I think the thing that that really triggered uh, Marco at the time was the fact that Blast was so close. There was um, none of the like. It didn't matter how good you were in terms of rankings, you could still not be a part of the group stage. Like it was only for the teams that were a partner team. Meanwhile, if you compare it to how ESL has worked, there's always like. For Pro League, as an example, like what half of the teams come through, like sure. different qualifiers and different regional things and world rankings and things of that nature. But there was no way for you to be in Blast unless you went through the online qualifiers into like, what was it like? Three different qualifiers we had to go through into the showdown and then win the showdown and get into the spring finals in 2022. That was like 15 whatever play days they had to go through and win every single match throughout that to make it into the. Meanwhile, also, in the terms of points, like 2022, I think it's the most uh, r ridiculous year where OG was qual qualified for the World Finals and we didn't. Even though we had a pretty solid 2022, we were one of the top five teams in the first half of the year. A sure. bit less of a stellar second half of the year, but I feel like our achievements should have been you know, well enough for us to qualify for the World Finals. And OG just literally got the spot because they had played in the groups and they got free points in the last World Final. Uh, Last World Finals leaderboard. Um, so I think those kind of things is the ones that triggered him the most. I don't think he fundamentally had an issue with the franchise leaks or semi-franchise leaks, uh, apart from the fact that if they're fully closed, then then it's a it's a it's a problem for him. Um, but I think one notion I want to make is the fact that back in 2020 to 2021, I think we would have been we would have probably been screwed if we didn't have VSL partnership at the time. You know, going to pivot into the international lineup for sure. That was a bargaining chip for us to use. That we have the pro league spot, right? That we can give a team an opportunity to fight against a tier one. But then it was also like it's not like you're just guaranteed to be a part of a tier one circuit. That's only like two uh, attempts you have at playing the best yes. teams, right? You still have to be successful. You still have to get get the ranking points to continuously be fighting in those tier one tournaments. So nothing was guaranteed apart from, you know, a few play days in pro league per year. Uh, and then potential revenue share that you get through that. 
But apart, apart from everything else, it's still a matter of you competing and being with some of the best teams in the world. I think some of people outside are putting a little, a little bit too big on the narrative on the fact that, yeah, there were outliers like EG who were just an abomination of a Counter-Shark fr- team for, for a long time. And they were just floating in those partnerships for, for a long time without doing anything competitively. But if you look at the, the teams that were a part of these partnerships, majority of them, out, outside of the couple of outliers, they were mostly the best teams in the Counter-Strike yes. universe. So, yeah, I don't know. I guess it's just a matter of perspective. By the way, since obviously the last interview we did was actually basically just before Spinks went to Vitality, if you go and look timeline-wise, at the time we had that discussion about like the problem obviously with a player like that is if you're an org of your size, it's like the better they get, the more likely the big team comes and tries to get them, right? What I wanted to know is just this, what was the vibe after he left? Because I have to say, even if, what people don't know about me is this Natu. I might seem like a very pessimistic person, but the joke is that's just because I'm talking about other people I'm mega optimistic about myself the point is I just I'm not in control of what other people do so sadly I'm a, I'm a little bit cynical I'll sort of be like I think they'll probably just fuck up or whatever so I, I if it was me I would I would tell myself the dream of like oh don't worry like we'll get like another player I mean the joke is you can never know that there literally was another Israeli player nerds that was amazing that was out there who would also be awesome but I'd go don't, we'll find the next Sphinx guys don't worry like we'll keep the core we'll build back up again and one day we'll be back where we are but part of me even then would sort of be like I hope because, you know, like, you can never know if you get a player that good, right? It's kind of crazy that after selling that player, it was actually, like, you could argue the next year, and this is even better. And, and Nerds himself is amazing. You eventually won IEM Dallas. It's kind of like an amazing... Within the space of about a year, that's that's an amazing transformation. I'm sure a lot of people would have said it would be more like the Valdera. Like, you, you have a harder time. You can't find someone quite as good. You have to go down a little bit. You're just, like, now in the group stage. So what was it like within the org? Was Spirits able to stay up? Was there ever a moment you wondered, will we be back at the top again? Because obviously that was like... You were coming right out of the semifinals of a major at that point in time. This was big-time stuff. Um, I think we'd had gone through enough shit to not be derattled. <laughs> we knew, you know, we it was a big, uh, big buyout, of course, with Sphinx. So we knew also it kind of gave us a lot of chips to play with, you know, in terms of upgrading and doing things, which we did. You know, we um, now our current op or Hades was benched at the time when we picked up some Pias. Uh, and then um, after a, a pretty thorough process they ended up going with valde for the for the end of 2023 and then eventually we or 2022 rather and then um things didn't work as well as the, the team wanted to and i think it was still a necessary period of time in terms of the learning process of the team because it was not only issues with with valde gelling in the team or having the right role or whatnot but also with some pious you know he came like people forget he came in into the team from movie star writers where he had had a couple of good events um, and one thing to note, by the way, Sampaias was on the radar already before the, oh, okay. the big run he had. Uh, I think like early, late twenty twenty, early twenty twenty two. He was like also like sort of in a short list of if we need to to make moves with the upper. Um, but anyway, there was still like he came in as a player that had ma- massive impact on the CT side, opping. But he was a little bit met on the seat on the T side. I think um, the team, the coaching staff, everyone they went through a, a really big process. Uh, to make him a bit more selfish, you know, understanding that his skill sets and what he can do on the TSA side. So, because he was a bit too setting up other people to play, you know, being the guy who was always throwing the nades, but instead he, with his skill sets, he needs to be a m- bit more aggressive. So it was also a process which took a few months, so half a year or whatnot, to get him up to speed and really understand his potential. Uh, and now we see, you know, what 2023 was like for him, right? So and then picking up Nerds, it just kind of unlocked everything for them. And if they, they found the right combination of players to make the deep runs that they did, unfortunately, not as many titles as, as we would have wanted to and the team would have wanted, but still like legitimate runs throughout the, the year uh, with the lineup even better than what we had before. So it's a combination of, the, of those things. But never felt like, I never felt like, you know, we're not going to be up there again. I feel like we've gone through enough of these different <coughs> phases and changes to kind of understand that there's always going to be that next opportunity and having the people we had on the helm of the team i had full full confidence that they'll find a way or we'll figure it out you know how to be as competitive as possible but you can never know if you're going to be you know in the top five you know fighting for championships every single time or whether you have to have to, have to settle for being around the top 10 and then maybe make a move later later on to to try to try to get there 
I think one thing that is sometimes taken for granted is if someone hears like I am Dallas, they're going to do that thing where it's like, well, it's not the biggest event. It's not Kavitsi. It's not a major. It's like, I want to tell people that there's a lot of great pro players and top teams that never win a trophy. Like ever. They just like come in third once is like a good performance or you made a final, you lost like to actually win a trophy. I mean, I just assume, especially in an org where you've had, you don't have the most money. It's a big deal to win an IM trophy, right? Yeah, for sure, for sure. I mean, the last trophy we had won in Connor Shark was, was Madrid in 2019. So <laughs> okay, it had been okay. literally four years. Like, we'd made the finals, the semifinals, so many freaking times, but we just could not take the last step. So, uh, and in Dallas, it just felt like it was inev- inevitable. Once we made the final, I felt like Mouse has, has no chance here. Sorry, Mouse, but it's our time to claim that trophy. Sure. By the way, I want to ask a question which goes like this. What is the status in ENTS of how you handle the whole finish angle? Because obviously, in theory, it isn't a finish team in terms of the counter strike angle. How do, how does that mean? It's just it won't be involved in the market as much. Is the, is there like a future one day where you want to come back and be in finish counter strike? What's the sense in that regard? Um, I think in the long term, um, we have we wish to have finished player or players in the in the main counter strike lineup. I don't think we considering how counter strike is today. I think it's a bit unrealistic to think that we would be fully finished Counter-Strike team in the future for the for the main team. But we do run a Finnish uh, academy team. There could be potentially international players in the academy team as well in the future, but we like to kind of like we always want to have a core of Finnish players in the academy. Uh, we also have a prospect team, which is like underneath the academy. So we go to the youngster, even younger guys. And then we have a prospect group. All of those are fully finished and we run all these different activities youth programs in Finland to try to uh, harness the Finnish, Finnish talent and, and try to you know teach them the right ways from an earlier age as possible. We have the Finnish roots. Um, we want to have Finnish players, uh, but at the same time, you know, we are in a global market. We're fighting for, for global, <clears throat> uh, global positions in, in the world of esports. But we do content in Finnish, and we, we definitely try to like also uh, make sure that we don't forget about our roots here in Finland by attending different events. You know, we're active at the assembly event each time we do. We spend a lot of money to be there um, for for the Finnish community as well. But yeah. What do you actually think about in Counter-Strike Finnish esports? Because I have to say, I was actually very impressed by that Elisa Masters Espoo event. Like when I watched it, I was even telling people, mate, if you took the, like brand off, you could think that was like an IM or something. This looked really good. Like the stadium looked set up, looked good. The team list, by the way, was way better than people would expect. It wasn't like the old school like assemblies where it's like the f- ends and then three other Finnish teams and like, you know, some tier two. There was like there was some of the best teams in the world went to this event. Like what what's going on in Finland? Why is the scene suddenly popping? Oh uh, yeah, it's it's definitely great that we get we're getting an international event. I think it's been long overdue. I think the last ones we had were the ROG ones in at the oh, assembly, right. assembly in 2015, where right. we had all the best teams in the world. Even I was playing at the time. That's how long ago it was. Um, so yeah, no, it's great that we have these events, and I think uh, kudos to the guys at Elisa Esports for um, taking one of the fun for the team and and you know going through the chaos of trying to put together an event like this. I know how small of a team they work with um, and they are on tight budgets and they pull through. So I think they even won an award for, for the visual oh, okay. uh, visuals of the event here in Finland, which is cool. Um, so in, in that terms, it's okay, but I'm a bit concerned with the fact that uh, in Finland, esports um, in, in the big picture is not doing that great, to be honest with you. Like most of the organizations are, either just like a hobby or very, very low key. Right. Like someone's doing this as a side business, you know, not many people are actually full-timing on it. Apart from Havu, uh, who are still like way, you know, less people than we are running a smaller uh, operation than we are a quite a big margin, but understandably so because they're focused on a market here in Finland, which is, you know, it restricts quite a bit in terms of how big you can actually uh, make it as a business because there's just not much money, you know, running around here. Uh, in Finland compared to, you know, different markets in Europe or, or globally. Um, so it's, uh, it's a, it's a bit, uh, it's trying times here in Finland in terms of esports and big picture, but at least we have an event, you know, once a year that's, uh, international scale, which is great. And I hope we'll continue to see, so see that happen. And I think <clears throat> Finland has been a Counter-Strike country for ever since Counter-Strike has been around. So I do hope, and I, I wish that we would, we could potentially even get a major, you know, one, one, one time in the future. 
By the way, as someone who is super old school in Counter-Strike, and you'll appreciate this angle I want to ask you about, which is I saw when this RMR finished, one of the things a lot of people did, because you notice now in the modern day, the other thing people do is they just try to find like sort of like interesting stats, like a, like they find a theme to it. And so one of the ones people were all posting after this RMR is like, obviously there's like barely anyone Swedish, even at the major, like there's no Swedish teams anymore. Like that whole thing, like, dude, we were around in the early 2000s. If there's one thing, if I was asked to put a bunch of predictions and someone said, make predictions that will never happen, one of my top ones would be like, Sweden will be irrelevant in Counter-Strike. Like, Sweden was like, not just that, they were like number one by far for like most of the time we've been in the game, right? Isn't it kind of surreal to you that they oh, they are irrelevant now? Like, it's kind of crazy, right? Yeah, it's actually <laughs> insane. <clears throat> like, remember, like, early CSGO days, we had Fnatic, we have NIP, and then a bunch of teams that were like a bit lower than them. Like, remember, like... um LGB was yes. it with uh, Olaf was playing yeah, there yeah. at the one time and so forth and so. But there were a lot of teams and players, and then I don't know what happened. To be fair with you, like it felt like maybe those players, similar to the Polish scene, had so much of the limelight, and they never like accepted younger players into the mix that it hurt the Swedish scene in the grand scheme of things, right? And then of course, like now you don't have investment from the likes of Fnatic or NIP to the Swedish community as much as you did. And then you only have like these smaller organizations just don't have the financial um surroundings to to kind of um yeah do as big things as with with, with the ecosystem having changed quite a bit since right. Um so I think they just don't have the resources to be fair. But it does feel really, really weird because Connor Shrek, like you said, early two thousands, even all the way up to like the first few years of CSGO, they were, you could even say dominant for, for yeah. a majority of Counter Strike history. Yes. Right, okay. As I said, this wasn't supposed to be some big blockbuster. It was more like check in with ENS, see what's going on there. So at the end of the interview, do you have a final message for people? Do you want to say hello to anyone or thank anyone? Uh, I want to thank all the, uh, I want to thank the Polish fans for the love we are getting. Uh, I hope they're listening, uh, because like, it's been insane to see how welcoming they have been, uh, and, uh, just been a lot of fun and, uh, yeah, thanks for the content, man. It's been, it's, I watch a lot of it, so keep doing you. Kitos. Kitos. Hear me now, because the thing is, I wouldn't be able to get all the work I do without my brethren, the man Dem in the Skrilluminati, my Patreon community. Because this video, like all of them on my channel, is kindly supported by Frisky, Matt Pugnaccio Racula, Ahmed Haju, Jensen Gore, Tobias Berners-Gorny, Animosity, Toucan, Tosh, and you know it, a special thanks always goes out to Jerky's Minion, who always has my back. Would you like to ask a question in my regular AMAs? Do you want to suggest a topic or a guest I could take in my work? Do you want teasers? Find out who the upcoming guests are going to be. Maybe you want to be part of those lengthy esports discussions I do with my top donators. Well, if so, put your money where your mouth is and join the Skrilluminati today, where? Via the Patreon link in the description box below.